During the season of Lent on Saturday, we are using Reverend William Williman's book, Fear of the Other. And um, Williman, if you're not familiar with him, he is a professor at Duke University Divinity School. He's a retired United Methodist bishop, and he's authored more than 60 books and sold over a million copies. And so um, today's sermon draws from the third chapter of that book entitled Learning to Fear like Christians. So just for starters, it is um, problematic for me to label a group as Christian and think we're all going to fall on the same page. Chances are good that in this place we'll be, we'll be close to all being on the same page, uh, but there's still going to be variations. And in the United Methodist Church, as United Methodists, the beauty thing is we can have a conversation and we don't necessarily have to come out in the same place. It's wonderful, that's grace, and that is a good thing. However, we know that there are, there are folks in this world who would claim to know better than that, and they would tell you that there's no conversation necessary. They might tell you there's no conversation allowed, and they'd be happy to tell you exactly whether or not you are a Christian. <laughs> it's like a light switch to them. Uh, you're, you're born again or you're not. You're saved or you're not. You're, you're, you're in or you're out. And they'd be happy to tell you which side of the fence you fall on. In the United Methodist Church, we understand faith as more of a journey. A journey that we never fully uh, finish in this, in this life. I've described it as walking with God and toward God throughout our lives. And every single day is an opportunity to, to learn and grow and love and try again. So what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to fear like a Christian? What does it mean to be reconciled to God? In our scripture today, we're looking at the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, 17 through 20. I invite you to listen to the word of God. So then, if anyone is in Christ, that person is part of the new creation. The old things have gone away, and look, new things have arrived. All of these new things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ by not counting people's sins against them. He has trusted us with this message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors who represent Christ. God is negotiating with you through us. We beg you as Christ's representatives, be reconciled to God. Thank you. Be reconciled to God. So what, what does that look like? Back in 2002, 2002, before I was called to ministry, I was a layperson here at Manchester, and I was at that time in a short-term Bible study class that met once a week for a number of weeks. And when we were toward the end of our time together, one of the guys in the class mentioned our English as a second language classes, our ESL classes that we've had here at Manchester for years, and how important it is that we sponsor that program, and how proud he was to be a part of a church that's involved with folks from all over the world who are just doing their best to learn to speak the English language even better. And then he shared something that had happened during that week. He said that there was uh, something that he had needed at our church library, and it was, it was during the week, and it was in the morning. And so he was just going to run to the church here quick and just, just pick up this book from our library. And our library is at the end of the education hallway. And, uh, and education hallway is where the ESL classes take place. And when he got here, um, the ESL classes were in session, and so all the doors were open in the hallway, but all the, there was nobody in the hallway. And so he was just going to make this quick. So he was trucking down that hallway to get to the library, and about that time a woman just sort of wandered out of one of the rooms, and she wasn't looking, turned toward him, and oh, I mean, it was like this. He said, we nearly ran into each other. He said, I nearly plowed her over. We just looked at each other. And he said, I said, excuse me, and I stepped to the side, and we walked past each other. And he said, you know, it really startled me. 
it startled you? And he said, she was in a full burqa. Now, this was just months after 9-11. And if you're not familiar with a burqa, a burqa is simply um, uh, clothing that many Muslim women wear. Uh, a burqa is a long, it's a long dress, it has long sleeves, it covers a woman, and they can be colorful and beautiful, and then there's a scarf that they wear around their head and their neck so that only you see their face. A full burqa is when the face is covered and all you see are their eyes. Now, that might not seem like that would be such a big deal until you've seen somebody in a burqa for the first time. I think that's when we realize um, how much we kind of depend on, we read each other's faces. We, look, we read each other's faces, uh, strangers in, and people we know, and it's just so unusual in that moment to not see a person's whole face, and they were standing like this, right? And for a person who was so high on ESL, he said, I don't understand why they can't show their faces. He was startled by the whole thing. It made him uncomfortable. And you know, I, I've since thought about her. I've thought about that woman, right? Who that morning got up and put on her garb of faith, left no one wondering what her faith might be, came to this big Christian church to learn to speak English with other students from all over the world who speak all different languages, and she's learning largely from Caucasian American teachers. And she's in her classroom, and I mean, who knows? Maybe she needed to use the restroom, right? And, and she just, she's not expecting anybody, or she's thinking about other things, and she just kind of steps out of this room and turns into this, this tall, able-bodied Caucasian American male who nearly wipes her out. Oh my gosh! And in that moment, they look at each other, in each other's eyes in that moment. I mean, to be reconciled to God, what does that look like? You know, my guess is in that moment, even though both were perfectly safe, and they were, they were both completely startled for different reasons. They both were experiencing fear of the other in that moment. And I would assume, as a woman, I would assume that her sense of vulnerability and fear of the other certainly ran deeper than his as a rule. Our author, Dr. Willeman writes, fear accompanies vulnerability. Good fear can be the result of an appropriate assessment of our situation. Wrong fear tends to be a function of our imagination more than the reality of our true situation. Fear out of proportion to the threat of the object of our fear. Fear that plays upon the insecurities and builds artificial barriers between us. Fear that cheats us of all that God intends us to be. To be reconciled to God, what does that look like? This book that we're using on Saturday, this fear of the other, has been really challenging to me. I mean, I assumed that it would be challenging. I want to be challenged when I'm preparing sermons. I want to be. But this book and the accompanying sermon preparation has at times been, I mean, it's been convicting. It's been convicting, it's been frustrating, and then revealing, and then annoying, and then enlightening, and then uncomfortable all over again every week. And, and then I thought, well, you know what? Considering we're in the season of Lent, isn't that kind of where we're supposed to be in the season of Lent? Kind of off balance just a little bit, right? I think it's more than completely appropriate to feel this way during this time. And this week's chapter that we're dealing with um, has to do with how Christians are meant to be different. And not just for our sake, but for the sake of others. To be reconciled to God. You know, what does that look like? As I mentioned earlier, I think it's problematic to group Christians and assume we'll all understand what that means. I mean, you just consider the hundreds of Protestant denominations. I mean stemming from different understandings of Christianity. And there are Christians who are taught to fear God and not in a sense of awe and wonder, but to be fearful of this wrathful, punishing, and angry God who would just as soon send us to hell as welcome us home. 
but as United Methodists, we understand God and God's grace differently than that. And, and because we do, we sometimes need to pay more attention to a tendency to become too comfortable, too self-assured with our, our understanding of God and the grace of God. Because, I mean, we know God is far more than a lenient parent. We understand that God absolutely has expectations of us. We, we understand from the greatest commandment, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and the second is like it, they come as a set, to love your neighbor as yourself. We understand that, and I think that loving God piece, well, you know what? We're pretty good with that, loving God, right? Because I think we figure out pretty quickly God loves us back. Either God chased us or we chased God. We caught each other and, oh, this is nice. We like this. I mean, we welcome this personal relationship with Christ, which is important and a primary piece of our prayer time for many of us. But if we're not careful, this whole, you know, just Jesus and me thing, our relationship with God can quickly become myopic. Just Jesus and me. Well, okay, just Jesus and me and my family. Well, and maybe my neighborhood and my church and maybe my workplace, but uh, that's it. That's it. It's that loving neighbor as yourself. That's the bugaboo. That's the really hard part. I mean, come on. It's hard enough to love our family and friends some weeks, right? Right? Let alone a neighbor who could be a stranger, a complete stranger, and not only that, but a stranger in need. And what if they don't deserve the help? Have you ever thought that before? Maybe not said it out loud, but has that thought ever crossed your mind? Something like, well, those people, that person, they made a bad decision, and now what? We're supposed to take care of them? Hmm. To be reconciled to God. And what does that look like? I thought as I was putting this together, <clears throat> I thought it would be interesting if Jesus showed up in human form for worship. Not in the way we would recognize him, you know. Not in the, you know, the long hair and the long beard and the long, you know, no, no, no. What, what if he showed up as a, as a kid? You know, what, what if Jesus showed up as an elderly man or as a middle-aged woman, a, a mother of three? What if you're sitting next to Jesus this morning, right? And, and, and Jesus is taking all of this in, right? The, the beautiful music and the prayers and the, just all the good things that are happening in this space. And, and not only that, he's taking in everything that's on our hearts and our minds, every one of us, everything that's going on in this space. And all the while, he is aware of extraordinary need in parts of St. Louis County and certainly in the city of St. Louis and that that's our home. To be reconciled to God, and what does that look like? In our scripture, the Apostle Paul knows that this ministry of reconciliation is a big responsibility. First thing I think we need to figure out is, you know, where are we in this process? Where are each of us in our faith journey? And as Christians, the ministry we've been given to invite, to encourage, to set an example, to love our neighbors as ourselves, this stuff is just absolutely critical. How can we help others find their way? How can we walk alongside others in their faith if we're hesitant? You know, if we're stuck, if we're judging, if we fear the other. Because after all, who is my neighbor? Any human being, and particularly any human being in need. To be reconciled to God, what does that look like? Well, you know what? 
I think we have an idea. I do. I think we've seen glimmers of it. I think we've seen glimpses of it. I think we have experienced hope. We have felt love given and received. And the thing is, very often, it's through children. For example, Sneakers with Soul. Sneakers with Soul is a ministry that's been going on in this church for a number of years. And in the summer, we start collecting pairs of sneakers, new sneakers, for kids from kindergarten to 12th grade. Kids who wouldn't otherwise be able to have a new pair of shoes to start the school year. These, schools are these shoes are distributed at a, 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 a back-to-school event. We're working with other churches, and at that event, not only do kids get their new shoes, but they get a new backpack, they get school supplies, they get everything our kids get to start the school year. And if you've ever helped out at one of these events, oh my gosh, You'd see the joy in these children's faces. They get to pick out their shoes. For some of these kids, it's the first pair of new shoes they've ever had, which is really remarkable. A new backpack? Who doesn't want I like a new backpack. And to have all the school supplies, and then not only that, you look at the, the relief on their parents' face that these kids are going to have what they need to start off the school year. And they're so relieved. Reconciled to God and one another through new shoes and school supplies. And then just think about our, our bike rehab ministry. I mean, they do a lot of good things, but I want to pay attention particularly to what they do with Kingdom House. Quarterly, four times a year, our bicycle rehab ministry will deliver approximately 60 refurbished bikes to Kingdom House for kids who would never have a bike otherwise. And with every one of those bikes comes a helmet, and there's volunteers that come along and they help size those helmets so those kids are going to be safe. And for some of their parents, they'll get a bike to uh, ride to school or to, to get to their workplace. If you've ever helped at one of these events, if you've ever seen those bikes come off that truck, if you've ever seen those kids get there, and these bikes are beautiful. You've seen what the, our bike rehab ministry has done. These bikes are gorgeous. And to have a new bike helmet, it, it is absolutely delightful. And again, to see the relief in their parents' face. I mean, every kid, can you imagine a kid without a bike? I mean, every kid deserves to get a bike. Reconciled to God and one another through refurbished bikes and new helmets. And the final one is a little bit different, but, but not so much. Food for kids. We work directly with a, an elementary school in West County and an elementary school in the city. And in both those schools, there are kids who receive subsidized breakfast and lunch. And when they are home on the weekend, too often there's not enough food in the house and they go hungry. Now there's just no reason for that. Food for Kids is a program where we collect certain, certain foods and that's a photo of the flyer. It shows you exactly what's needed. This stuff is single serving. It fits into a backpack and what happens is these kids on Friday when they are getting ready to go home on the bus, they're given a backpack that's full of food for the weekend. And guess what? Nobody knows but them. Nobody knows they're taking home a backpack full of food. That's their business. And then they bring that backpack back on Monday, and the next Friday, they do it all over again. Can you imagine the relief that kid has knowing there's food in that bag and he's not going to be hungry that weekend? Can you imagine the relief of the parents? It's a beautiful thing. Reconciled to God and one another through single serve microwavable meals. <laughs> It's just not that hard, right? It's not that hard. If we struggle at times to love our neighbors as ourselves, well then, let's just keep in mind, you know what, if it was easy, it wouldn't be a commandment, right? And it's something that we are all working on the rest of our lives. So as we continue to learn to love the other rather than fear the other, as we move forward in our faith journey, and our desire to love our neighbor, I would encourage you to pay attention to, recognize this very natural compassion we have for children in need. You know what that is, right? That heartfelt desire to make a difference. 
May we in time come to understand that in God's eyes, we all, every blessed human being on this planet, we are all beloved children of God. To be reconciled to God, what does that look like? Amen.